How are you doing tonight? That's a little better. My name is Keith Benny. I'm the acting director of learning here at TIFF. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Books on Film. This is our fifth event in our series. And as mentioned tonight with the one and only Michael Ondaatje. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We're on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to show the work of Indigenous filmmakers here at TIFF. For instance, we are currently showing uh, Nipawista Masuin, We Will Stand Up. Director and educator Tasha Hubbard offers a personal reflection on the death of young Cree man Colton Bushi and the trial and acquittal of the man who shot him. We hope that you can join us to see this very important film. It begins as a new release and will play over the next two weeks here at TIFF. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank Warby Parker, our presenting partner for the series, uh, Penguin Random House Canada, who's our long-standing uh, programming partner, and Star Metro, our media partner. And as always, a big thank you to our donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's charitable mission, which is to transform the way people see the world through film. Um, after the screening and talk this evening, please do stick around for a very special opportunity. Uh, Michael Ondaatje will join us for a book signing outside the cinema. Copies of his latest novel, Warlight, as well as The Conversations, Walter Murch, and The Art of Editing Film, and The English Patient are all available for purchase at TIFF Concessions if you did not bring a copy with you. Uh, a reminder that our final Books on Film event on June 24th will feature Man Booker Prize shortlisted novelist Rachel Seifert on the film adaptation of her novella, The Dark Room, a gripping survival story about the Holocaust and its legacy. Uh, single tickets are still available for this event if you'd like to come out and join us in a few weeks' time. If you're a subscriber and you'd like to uh, change your seats to sit with your friends, um, please visit our box office team downstairs who can do that for you. And now, without further ado, to get us started this evening, please join me in welcoming the host of Books on Film, the incomparable Eleanor Wachtel. Donald Edwin Westlake was born in Brooklyn in 1933 into an Irish family. As he tells it, his mother believed in all superstitions, plus she made some up. One of her beliefs was that people whose initials spelled something would be successful in life. That's why he says, I went through grammar school as Dewdrip, <laughs> D-E-W Donald E. Westlake. Names became a kind of thing for him when later he was so prolific, he was producing more books than his publisher could handle. So he wrote under various pseudonyms, including John B. Allen, Tucker Coe, Samuel Holt, Edwin West, and many others, and as we'll discuss, Richard Stark. Meanwhile, after Catholic grammar school, he went to college. He served two and a half years in the US Armed Air Force. In the mid-1950s, he was posted to Germany. He studied at two more universities, but he didn't graduate. As he said, he knew from the age of 11 that he was a writer. It took the rest of the world about 10 years to begin to agree. Once he got going, Westlake was a phenomenon. Early on, he wrote 46 short stories in one year, of which 27 were published. In a career spanning almost 50 years, he died in 2008 at the age of 75, he produced more than 100 books and five screenplays. None was adapted from his own novels, but he did get an Oscar nomination for his adaptation of Jim Thompson's the book, the, Cri the Grifters, and he won three Edgar Awards and the title Grand Master from the Mystery Writers of America. In 1962, Westlake created a new bad guy, a ruthless, cool career criminal named Parker. The book was called The Hunter, and its author was also a new invention, Richard Stark. It was meant to be a one-off title. It's partly why he didn't bother to give him a first name. But his editor called him and asked for a rewrite of the final chapter to enable Parker to be at the center of a whole series of novels. Westlake produced 24. And these fast-paced, fierce, bleak, spare books are regarded by many as his best. As one critic wrote, Parker is probably the greatest anti-hero in all fiction. 
He's certainly the most influential of Westlake's characters. Crime fiction, crime movies, and crime comics today wouldn't be the same without Richard Stark. But it's that very first one, The Hunter, that became Point Blank. Fifteen of Westlake's titles were adapted for the screen, and Point Blank is widely considered its best. A masterpiece, endlessly intriguing, writes film historian and critic David Thompson. A crucial film in the development of the cinema's portrait of America as a complex of organized crime. It wasn't an immediate hit at the box office when it was released, though the French loved it, and some reviewers were dazzled and saw it as a kind of breakthrough for Hollywood. Of course, it's since become a cult classic. It was named one of the 25 best crime films of all time by The Guardian newspaper, which described it as one of the most inventively eye-popping thrillers of the 60s. The movie came out in 1967 was, and was directed by England's John Borman. This was only Borman's second film, his first Hollywood production, and his first movie in color. Borman, who's since become famous for Deliverance, Hope and Glory, Excalibur, and The General, among others, he's made 22 features, started off in television as a documentary filmmaker. After the mild success of his debut movie, starring the popular British band The Dave Clark Five, a well-received musical inspired by the Beatles' Eight Days a Week, Boorman was eager to go to America. He was in his early 30s. Here's how he described what happened. I'm going to read a little bit from his memoir, Adventures of a Suburban Boy. Press agent and wannabe producer Judd Bernard sent me a script based on a Richard Stark, that is Donald Westlake, pulp novel. It was appalling. He also gave it to Lee Marvin, who was in London shooting The Dirty Dozen, and arranged for us to meet. I suggested a modest Italian restaurant in Soho. I was intimidated by Marvin's presence, his height, the huge head, the deep resonant voice. Everything around him seemed diminished. The tables and chairs were too small, the waiters dwarfed. I felt like a miniature creature from another tinier planet. He had just won the Academy Award for Cat Baloo. Lee had no interest in small talk. What do you think of this piece? I said it was a collection of cliches. Judd was kicking me under the table. Lee said, I agree, it's a piece of shit, so why are we here? <laughs> the character Parker is interesting, I said, and I like the idea of a man betrayed by his wife and his best friend and the futility of his quest for revenge. I stumbled on, not saying much more than that, and realizing as I spoke about it that once again, it reflected the story of my own father and mother and their friend, Herbert. Perhaps there was some kind of emotional resonance in my voice that Marvin picked up. He said very little. Lee Marvin and John Borman met a few more times in London, just the two of them. One warm autumn night, we talked till the small hours. We drank a lot. Lee began to speak of his war as a Marine, fighting the Japanese through the islands of the Pacific. He had killed, been wounded, knew fear, had committed terrible acts. He was afraid that he had lost some essential element of his humanity in that brutal experience. The story, as I described it to him, touched on something he dreaded to confront in his own life, yet was drawn to. At the end of that evening, Lee looked me in the eye and he said, I'll do this flick with you on one condition. What's that? He tossed the script out of the open window. <laughs> it's because of Lee Marvin that the movie got made, and since he was at the height of his fame, he was given casting and script control, which he amazingly handed over to John Boorman. He's very much the star of the movie, Parker, now named Walker, but I should mention that Sharon Acker, who plays his wife Lynn, and John Vernon, his former friend and his wife's lover, Reese, are Canadian. And then there's Angie Dickinson. She had worked with Lee Marvin both before and after Point Blank. Now to tonight's guest. I got to know novelist and poet Michael Ondaatje when I first moved to Toronto more than 30 years ago. And for as long as I can remember, he talked about how Point Blank is one of his favorite movies. Michael himself has often been called a cinematic writer for the vivid imagery and sweep of his work. He has other connections to the movies. He once took the Canadian Film Center's program for directors. He's made several documentaries. And of course, the film adaptation of his novel, The, Engl <clears throat> Excuse me, the English Patient, won nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture, in 1997. 
Those of you who've been coming to Books on Film since the beginning will recall his appearance here to talk about his novel and film. Ondaatje was the first Canadian to win Britain's prestigious Booker Prize, and then last summer on the 50th anniversary of the award, the English patient won the Golden Man Booker Prize. But mostly, Michael Ondaatje is a great fan of the movies and those who create them. In 2002, he put together a book of, his con of a year of his conversations with the legendary film editor, Walter Murch, famous for his work with Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, and Anthony Minghella, the director of The English Patient, among many others. To come full circle, one of the epigraphs to Michael's book about editing is by Donald E. Westlake, and John Boorman reviewed the title for the Los Angeles Times. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Michael Andachi. So I remember with The English Patient, you told us to pay attention to the music and the sound design at the opening of the film, the bells, and I'm sure something else. Mm. So what do you want us to notice in the Point Blank? Well, first, I, you are telling me all amazing things about the Point Blank and Lee Marvin, which I never knew. So anyway, thanks for that. Um, anyway, briefly, I just want to say something more about Westlake and Stark, because um, Westlake... Um, the books he wrote were all very, very funny books. And, you know, if you saw the movie The Hot Rock with um, Robert Redford, that was based on Donald Westlake's book, which is the least likely film to be connected with um, Point Blank. And as you said, he had, uh, Westlake had all these pseudonyms. Uh, there was one called Tucker Co., which I never read. I didn't like the name, so I didn't read those books. And as you said, Morgan uh, Cunningham, J. Morgan Cunningham, and uh, as Morgan Cunningham, Westlake wrote a book called Comfort Station, supposedly inspired by Arthur Haley's Hotel. So another Canadian connection. Um, and in that book came with a blur by Donald Westlake saying, I wish I had written this book. <laughs> um, there's something about Westlake's whole life, which is you know, three quarters comic. So this is why the Stark books are so surprising. And because Westlake's characters are always funny, always dysfunctional as, as criminals, whereas Parker or Walker, as in, in, in this film, is dangerously efficient and unforgiving. The Hunter was not a funny book. It was tough and brutal, and it ended badly and with no happy ending. But Borman's film, to me, because of its style and enigmatic perspective, has some of Westlake's edge of humor, so that we are studying Walker more than identifying with him. Anyway, watch out for a couple of things. It's been a while since I've seen the film. And watch out for many quick, fast-paced moments. There's the opening of an elevator, for instance, and the misuse of a telescope that looks out onto the city. Thank you. When did you first encounter the work of Donald Westlake? I guess it was with this film. You know, I hadn't read Westlake at all. I, I, I saw Point Back, got an impressionable age. How, how, I, what age do you I mean? have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nine, <laughs> you know. Um, so that, would have, been, that would have been in Sri Lanka? Well, if you no, were no, no. Well, I don't know when the film came out. But it was 67. Not, 60, I think it was 67 then. And I hadn't read Westlake or I hadn't read Rich Stark then. And in fact, I never read The Hunter until quite recently, and it's quite, it's a terrifying book, actually. It's pretty mean-spirited as well. Um, but I did read some of the other Parker books because I, I, I thought Lee Marvin and uh, Andrew Dickinson were the perfect central characters. And what's very interesting about the books is that while the Andrew Dickinson character is not in The Hunter, I mean, the, the sister is there, but not very much, the character of Claire, she's called in the later books, is there all the time. So it's almost as if um, um, Richard Stark decided that this is a good pairing. So she, they're constantly in books together. And again, she still calls them Parker. You know, they're like an English school. And, um, you know, and she's kind of, he drives her mad, but they're, they're still together. What did you like about his work? The, the writing? Yeah. 
Well, I, I had read the, some of the Donald Westlake books, which are funny and a bit too funny for me, I think. But uh, but I think uh, Stark, the character of Westlake is a funny person and everything he writes, even the idea of kind of saying, I wish I had written this book, you know, uh, it's, it's a kind of running gag about writing, I think. You know, he he made friends with other writers who were all kind of coming out of the kind of really bad woodwork of literature, you know, and, and, and doing well. Um, the later books, the later Parker books were very interesting because they were so terse and they kind of, that minimal dialogue by, by him, you know. If, you, if you've read Lee Child, the contemporary, very popular writer, I think he was very strongly influenced by Westlake. The, the, the Jack Reacher character yeah, Jack is, is Reacher a kind character. of Parker, yeah, Parker type. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it's like he's worried about his toothbrush and not much else, you know, and, yeah. and Marlin is, is in, just wants the money back, you know. So. Where did he get those suits? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to find out later on, maybe in this uh, discussion. But um, I think they go very, it's Hollywood, you know, this is MGM. Yeah, yeah. That's so. quite different from, from the book. Yeah. You've written it well. You've enjoyed a few of the charming crook novels Westlake wrote under his own name. You preferred Stark's Parker. Utterly, I'm, I'm quoting you here, utterly untrustworthy, unworthy, violent, and yet tersely moral. And I think it's that last word, I mean, moral, that might surprise people. I think most critics regard Parker at best as amoral. I think oh, I, it's probably the wrong use of the word as usual by me. But, you know, I, I think that it, it, it's just that he has a, a certain strict set of rules, rather like the guy who's going to, you know, um, not kill him, you know, uh, the, the sniper. You know, he's just, he just wants his money back. It's a very simple rule. You know, he was paid to do something and he's going to get the money back. Well, of course, it's ridiculous. But, you know, that's what, there's a slightly comic air, you know, to to his obsessions. And, for instance, in the book, uh, The Hunter, uh, there's a, you know, at the end, he has to have his face changed because everyone will recognize him. And he goes and does a bank robbery, but he refuses to buy a mask. Because why bother to buy a mask? Because he's going to have his face changed anyway. You know, so that kind of odd, you know, strictness of uh, order for him exists. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll talk more about the difference between the, the book and the film. But mm. you, you met Donald Westlake. What was he like? Uh, he was a very sweet man. I was at a uh, there was a film festival um, that Russell Banks had organized in northern New York State. And I actually went because I knew that uh, Westlake was going to be there. And I, Russell had asked me to come and read. So I, I met him and, and I, I brought all these cheap paperbacks with me of Richard Stark. And he was a bit of a shock by the bad quality of the, how old these books were, you know. And you have, uh, one, you have one in your pocket. Yeah, I, I want to show you. Apparently it's quite valuable now because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's from 1962 when the book was published. Yeah. yeah Fawcett edition. Mm -hmm. No, I, I read several of them. And, and later on, the books became actually more interesting and kind of um, forgiving. Well, Parker, Parker does forgive people. But you know, there was a kind of strange thing where he would uh, end on a kind of sudden kind of sentence which was so underplayed that he thought, what happens now? You know, And he was a lot of trickery by West. Uh, Stark, Westlake, about how books began and how books ended. And um, uh, th I think we both found this, this thing which I could read, which is the first sentences of some of the Parker books. I, yeah. I, I think I've got some. you got a list? I have a list, too. Yeah. It's, he, ha he had this tick of, well, you said. <laughs> well, one of the things he, uh, uh, I think Block, another uh, writer, started discovering that all these um, opening sentences, not all of them, had a kind of structure. Here's one. In The Hunter, when the fresh-faced guy in a Chevy offered him a lift, Parker told him to go to hell. In The Man with the Getaway Face, when the bandages came off, Parker looked in the mirror at a stranger. So this, in fact, the getaway one is a follow-up to The Hunter. So Parker has a new face. Um, when the guy with the asthma finally came in from the fire escape, Parker rabbit punched him and took his gun. Um, when the knock came at the door, Parker was just turning to the obituary page. So some of them are, are just quite yeah. very low key. And, and I'll, I'll read the in between. When the woman screamed, Parker awoke and rolled off the bed. <laughs> <laughs> when the bellboy left, Parker went over to the house phone and made his call. Yeah. Now you get the pattern. <laughs> when the yeah Parker 
But what it does is it kind of actually sets, you know, it, it right away gives you that there was a past to the story. You know, that here's Parker again. At the first sense, you don't need to say Parker. He, you could say he. You know, and and then there's always this kind of odd, low key ending where he could say a lot more. There was one book where they had to find this one person uh, who had betrayed them, and Parker actually finds them somewhere, and he has a fight that goes on for about 20 pages, the most violent fight. And he comes back, and he comes back and meets his friends, and, and one of them says, did you find Johnson? And Parker says, yeah, end of book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a continual running gag. There's something kind of witty about this guy, you know. And... Um, Westlake is very funny. I mean, uh, there's a book called The Getaway Car, I think I mentioned to you, um, which uh, his, he was published after he died, and his wife titled it because she said he was such a bad uh, um, driver who was always being arrested for speeding, and he was always driving as if he was in a getaway car. And, and uh, she, you know, she, he talks about, um, you know, he, I mean, he was writing these really essentially trashy novels, and his wife was reading Proust. And, and finally, she, he said, OK, should I read Proust? And he, he, he does. And he says, you know, after, the, after we've discovered he has no passing gear, he's really good. It was a perfect description of Proust, you know. He has no passing no gear. No passing gear. He doesn't speed up to you know, finish the chapter or anything like that. And, and he's constantly very funny about other writers. He has an amazing essay on um, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, and he hates Chandler. He says he's just a mama's boy. You know? <laughs> I know. He's never right, but you know, he's kind of well, continually opinionated. It's, speaking of fighting, I, I, I don't know if you have an answer to this question, but there's, you know, there's this scene where he beats up three guys backstage at, at the jazz bar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a prolonged scene, and it was quite striking because, I mean, pun intended, he punches a guy in the crotch, and it was like considered quite shocking hmm. at the time, and everything. And then he leaves, and then he he has a gun in his pocket. So why did he bother going through <laughs> be, <laughs> taking on three guys behind? Except that it's a you know very dramatic scene backstage, yeah. and the jazz singer is they, there's juxtaposition, yeah, yeah. cross cutting, everything. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Um, let's let's turn directly to Point Blank, the film and the book, which mm. are in many ways very different. Um, John Borman says he never read the book. Right. <laughs> Does that surprise you? Um, no, it doesn't actually. I mean, I, I I didn't read the book when I saw the movie, so I, I we have the same kind of take on what <laughs> who Parker is and who Claire is. You know, I mean, so I think that, that was okay. I I I don't think I, if I read the book even at a very young age, I don't think I would have liked it. You know. I think the later books are more interesting, but I came to the books through the fiction of film, in a way, you know, which is, which is odd. And the the I mean, the, there are so many differences between the book and the movie. I mean, mm -hmm. the book is set mostly in New York, uh, San Francisco, not Los Angeles. Uh, Parker, this is a tiny detail, but I'm like I'm like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Parker is owed forty five thousand in the book. In the movie is ninety three thousand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they get these things. At the end. I guess most important, Parker does go for the money. Mm -hmm. In the in the film, it's very ambiguous whether he's he gets the money and then two cops manage to kind of switch suitcases. Yeah, so, so he gets the money and then he loses the money in the in the book. Yeah, in the movie, I thought when I watched it that he wait, he waits for everyone to leave and then he'll go down and get it. Yeah. But other people seem to think that he just walks away. Mm -hmm. He melts into the shadows. Do you I have a he, sense? I think he went and got the money. He went. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay. He wait about three or four days, and then yeah, around. then he would yeah. go and get it. Yeah, he wait till there's no there are yeah. no shooters or anything. You ran into the shooter, you said. Yeah, I was doing a reading in the states um, of of Arnold's Ghost, which is where I actually have a reference to this film. And this guy came up at the end. He was looking at me, and I, he looked very familiar. And he said, "Do you know who I am?" I said, "No, I'm the shooter in Point Blank." <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was kind of weird. <laughs> Now, Westlake was was a pro when it came to adaptation. He talked about how a movie isn't the book, and and in almost every case, it, it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. That movies are a different form. My favorite is when he was asked about the movie's cult status, and he said, "I've always loved Point Blank, sort of the way the Neanderthal mother loved that first hairless mutant." <laughs> Did that come from me? 
<laughs> and I never get over being astonished at how far that original toss has sailed. Mm -hmm. how, how do you relate to them? You've had the English patient and now in the skin of the lion is in the works. Mm -hmm. Do you relate to the, 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 dis the distance between the, the in terms of adaptation, in terms of film? Well, I, I, I sort of had to read the book uh, recently. I mean, I hadn't read the book since it came out, uh, The English Patient. Uh, and then I thought, well, I better read it just in case, you know, someone really asked me a serious question about it. And and and, and I read it, and it, it just felt very, you know, I didn't really remember a lot of stuff, the, the thickness of it. You know, I just had re remembered the kind of basic story because I'd seen the film a few times. So, so... <laughs> <laughs> the film is so different from I your know, book. I know, but I, you know, I mean... When you think about a book that you wrote some time ago, all you worry about is what, 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 whatever criticism there was about it. Because, oh, perhaps that's wrong, you know. So I hadn't realized that there was that much stuff about Kip or that much stuff about Hannah and Hannah's past and Canada and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because so, Mengele dropped all that. Yeah, I guess he had to, you know. Because I, I thought when the film got made, I thought the scenes that would work were the scenes of Kip being in training for bomb disposal, you know. Which, you know, that's the kind of movies I grew up with in England. And, uh, of course, that wouldn't work because why have the training in bomb disposal? Because you know he's alive 10 years later. You know, there's no danger in bomb disposal. So and that kind of stuff. But... Um, well, they focused on the romance, yeah, too. Yeah. So what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> well, related to that, have the connection you feel between uh, your own work and then when it's it made when it is adapted. I mean, Westlake was obviously very detached and ready yeah, to say it. Yeah. Right? And now within The Skin of the Lion, or do you have anything to do with the production? Not, not really. I mean, I, it's still in, Early in, stages. in the realm of possibility. That's all. You know, so you don't really know. But I mean, Westlake is, is interesting because he did the... Um, what was the other film we were talking about earlier oh, on? Oh, The Grifters? The yeah. Grifters, which I do you've seen The Grifters, but actually that's yeah. a great film. Um, yeah, I hadn't realized that he wrote the screenplay. Yeah, he wrote the screenplay. And um, the director, whose name I also forgot. Stephen Frears. Stephen Frears uh, was told that he should hire Donald Westlake. And he met him and he said, I don't want to hire Donald Westlake. I want to hire Richard Stark. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's a, it's a great remark. Yeah. And um, Westlake has written about that friendship that happened with, um, with Frears. And that's one great line that Frears says somewhere here. Um, he told Westlake after they'd been, had a few meetings, he said, you know, there's nothing more loathsome, loathsome than actually making a film. And it's beginning to look as though I'll have to make this one. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, it, it's typical Freer's kind of grouchy voice, you know, but it, I think it's a fantastic film. And, it, you know, it really was, was only, you know, that, that script that Westlake wrote. Yeah, he, was, he was nominated for an Oscar for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, very good film. And there's a lot of Parker in that one. You know, there's a scene where uh, Angelica Houston is furious at some point and she's, she's waiting for an elevator. She's banging the banging on the button <laughs> 10 times. And it's exactly the kind of thing that Parker would have done or Walker would have done. Or Lee Marvin. I mean, yeah. I mean having seen Point Blank, isn't it? When you re read the Parker books, don't you see mm -hmm. Lee Marvin? I mm -hmm. mean, he just seemed to inhabit. And Andrew Dickinson, of course, it's a regular companion, I think. Who? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's You're, odd that the other books, in the other books, the, the, the Claire figure is very much the Andrew well, Dickinson character. Mike, Mike. Oh, the Andrew Dickinson character. Yeah. Point Blank figures in your novel, Annal's Ghost, as you were saying. Uh, tell me about Annal and her friend. Leaf's relationship and their enthusiasm for those kinds of movies. Okay. I, I don't, don't, don't read it. Don't, don't, don't read it yet. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to. Um, but um, in, in, in Arnold's Ghost, there's a woman called Arnold who's a forensic anthropologist, anthropologist and she works with another woman called Leaf. Uh, and they're in the States and they're kind of, you know, staying and they decide to just rent a lot of movies and watch them outside on the screen. And, you know, um, so they decide to watch all the movies with Andrew Dickinson and Warren Oates. And and so they're going to watch the whole set of works. And, now, are, are, is these, are these your obsessions? That I mean, I'm wondering why you've given it to your characters. Well, it's, it's, it's a scene I didn't know that much was going to happen with this scene when I began it, but Warren Oates was there, right? 
And no, I was uh, thinking of watching the entire work oeuvre, oeuvre yeah, of yeah, Angie well, Dickinson. And serious people do that. They do it at the film festival here, you know. Um, anyway, this isn't this isn't just light verse. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to tell you about this thing. Um, I'll just read this little paragraph first, okay, and then tell you what happens to it. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it. Okay, yeah, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a little paragraph. It says, the film they worried over most was point blank. At the start of the movie, Lee Marvin is shot by a double-crossing friend in the abandoned Alcatraz prison. The friend leaves him for dead and steals his girl and his share of the money. Vengeance results. Anil and Leaf composed a letter to the director of the film asking if he remembered all these years later where on the torso he imagined Lee Marvin was shot so that he could get to his feet, stagger through the prison while the opening credits came up and then swim across the bay. They were simply inquiring as forensic specialists. When they looked at the scenes closely, they saw Lee Marvin's hand leap up to his chest. See, he is difficulty with his right side. When he swims late in the bay, he uses his left arm. God, it's a great movie. <laughs> and then they actually write the letter and you include the letter. Why did, why did you include why the letter? Why do I include the letter? Yeah. I don't know. I think I, I had a little pause. What comes next? But it doesn't happen right away. It happens about 20 no, pages later. No, it happens later. about 20 pages later, yeah. 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 So I, I'm going to read the letter. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to read the letter. So, dear John Borman... I do not have your address, but a Mr. Walter Donahue from Faber and Faber has offered to forward this to you. I write on behalf of myself and my colleague, Leif Niedeker, about a scene in an early film of yours, Point Blank. At the start of the film, the prologue, as it were, Lee Marvin is shot from a distance of what looks like four or five feet. He falls back into a prison cell and we think he might be dead. Eventually, he comes to, leaves Alcatraz, and swims across the so-and-so straits into San Francisco. We are forensic scientists and have been arguing about where on his body Mr. Marvin was shot. My friend thinks it was a rib glance shooting and that apart from the rib break, it was a minor flesh wound. I feel the wound to be more serious. I know many years have passed, but perhaps you could try to remember and advise us of the location of the entry wound and exit wound and recall your discussions with Mr. Marvin as to how he should react and move later on in the film when time had passed and his character had recovered. Sincerely, Anil Tessera. So now, I, this is all very meta. Yeah. Walter Donahue at Faber and Faber is a real person? Yeah. He's the film editor at Faber and Faber, who I luckily knew and knew how to get a, the book to him, you know. But um, the, it, it began because I, uh, when there are these two women are watching these films, they're talking about the movie Red River, and it's, uh, John Wayne shoots the, you know, some minor character, and they, which seems very un, unexpectedly wrong at that point. And so they, they get into the discussion of what happened to the bullet on that one. So then it became point blank, which was an easy one to. Because, because you know it so well. Yeah, I knew it so well. And John Borman replied to Anil. Yeah, but not in the book, sadly. <laughs> Here, I find this. Here's the letter. Oh, thank you. And, 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 and you'll read the letter I'll for read us. The letter from John Borman, which came about a year later. All these letters were reading, you know. <laughs> Dear Anil, I'm responding to your question about my film Point Blank and sending this letter to Michael Ondaatje, since as a fictitious character, you lack corporality and abode. <laughs> Since the character of Walker is similarly insubstantial, I will attempt to speculate on the issue of his wounding and subsequent escape from Alcatraz. When I was writing the script with my friend Alex Jacobs and Bill Stair, we too puzzled over the issue without ever reaching a definitive conclusion. The tour guide in the movie points out that no prisoner ever succeeded in escaping by swimming across the straits with its fierce currents and icy waters, a wounded man would have less chance still. Could the bullets have missed or merely grazed Walker? If so, why call the movie point blank? Well, it was in the range, it was the range that was point blank. It was still possible for Reese to miss. We see Walker enter the water and start to swim. As a fictitious character, he might be more resistant to the cold <laughs> than someone non-fictitious. <laughs> There is evidence, however, that he did sustain a bullet wound. When he's in bed with Chris, Andrew Dickinson, substantial scar is visible on his abdomen. 
Was this makeup or a war wound sustained by the actor Lee Marvin? <laughs> the other interpretation that we considered was that the film is a, is a hallucination of revenge imagined by Walker in the moment of his death. After his shot, Walker mumbles a dream. Critics have argued that this is confirmation of the hallucin hallucination theory. However, I put in that line against my better judgment in order to pacify my literal minded critics in the MGM studio. We wrote several different endings and had the perfidious sneak preview system been in play then, I'm sure I would have been urged to reshoot the scene I finally chose. Walker refuses the money he has pursued so obsessively and melts into the shadows, suggesting that he is a shadow, but then film itself is a shadow. Yours, John Borman. <laughs> Pretty great letter, actually. So Borman does think he didn't take the money, unlike yeah, I know. Unlike we, well, I unlike know. us. Yeah. Yeah. And he may be wrong. He may be wrong. <laughs> and uh, your friend, uh, the critic uh, David Thompson, has written that the actual and the imaginary are perfectly joined in Point Blank, for it's not only an account of Lee Marvin's remorseless and romantic hacking away at the syndicate, but his dream in the instant that he dies. In other words. Thompson is one of the critics that Borman disapproves of yeah. for thinking that it's all a dream. I don't think we should take this film that seriously. <laughs> 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 but do you think of it as a dream? I mean, do you subscribe to that? No, not really. That? I mean, I, I, I'd rather have it a real story where he meets, you know... Angie Dickinson. Angie Dickinson, <laughs> and then has a nice new suit, you know, and, and gets rid of all Lloyd Bachner and all those other people, you know. Yeah. You've met John Borman. Yeah, I just about very briefly at, at some um, gathering, and I, I think I said something about Point Blank. He said, I, I made that 30 years ago. Great, you know. But no, I think he actually is, is obviously very fond of it now. I mean, I think it has caught on. You know, it's, it's yeah. an odd. It, it seems so unlikely that that film would be remembered five years after it was made, you know, but the fact that Lee Marvin was there, you know, was, I think, a huge thing for him. Borman was influenced by European cinema, the French New Wave, mm. Antonioni, the Red Desert in particular. How do you think it informs? I'm getting serious, yeah, but okay. how do you think it informs Point Blank? Well, I think what makes it work, I mean, apart from the kind of strange humor that no one else sees in it, is that it is, it is a very contemporary film. You know, it's, it, the time sequence is bizarre. The first five minutes is so, you're not quite sure where, we, where you are in that film. I mean, you have. Every time he goes to open a window um, or draw a curtain, he remembers another drawing of curtains. And there are even in just the last 10 minutes, there are so many you know, replays of the past. And I suspect that there were a lot of scenes didn't quite work. And so there was a lot of footsteps <laughs> going back and forth all the time. And um, silences, you know, I think when, his, uh, when he goes to see his wife, or his, uh, I think his wife in, in the book anyway, yeah. Um, there's a kind of uh, there's a lot of silence and suggestion of conversation, but that's not there. You know, th there's a lot of text missing, so they had to kind of disguise a lot of that. I think so. It is kind of very. It's a film I think that got made in editing. You know, in a, you know if you even just look at ten minutes of it, you can you know you can see that happening. You know, protecting well, the story and making it more interesting and suggestive and. Borman has said in, in that scene where he goes to see his wife and he just sits there stonily and she does all the talking, um, that when they were shooting it, he, he that's what he did. And he just sat there and he didn't give, he didn't feed Sharon Acker her lines. Mm -hmm. And so they decided, so she just started talking. She started delivering her lines without his cues. And then they, Borman said that they quickly rewrote it so that she would do all the, the no, whether she would do the, the she where where does the money come? It comes from this. Whereas Reese, mm -hmm. it does that, and he would just sit there, and mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. so. It's, I mean, that's almost Bergman esque in terms yeah. of you know, yeah. think of Persona or something where you know, uh, mm -hmm. Lee Volman is obsessively talking while B.B. Anderson, you know, sits and mm -hmm. then they, he cuts from one to the other. But um, it's also very chillingly American, I think. But yes, that is chillingly American. And, it made, and it's made by an Englishman, which is interesting. You know, uh, like the other film that uh, we talked about, whose author I can remember. Stephen Frears, Stephen Frears, Jim Thompson. Stephen Frears, <laughs> Stephen Frears, pure English, 
John Borman, pure English, two great American films. You know, it's kind of very strange. You know, not great American films, but yeah, sort of great American films. <laughs> Can you say why it's your uh, among your favorite favorites? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, if I had to pick my ten films, I probably wouldn't pick this film. You know, but uh, I, I really well. You know, if I was going on Desert Island, I'd probably want to see it again. You know, but I, I, I don't think I'd, I'm not going to, you know, cut the names into the wall or anything like that. Yeah. You've made reference to Donald Westlake in your other work. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a passage from uh, Richard Stark's The Sour Lemon Score. It's an epigraph to the collected works of Billy the Kid. In no, the I don't think that's right. It's not right? It's not there? No, I think it's in the book of poems. Even it's stranger. in the poems, the cinnamon, yeah. uh, Elizabeth. It comes under, after Elizabeth in the cinnamon peeler. Yeah, but in both, like I think it's just an epigraph to one section. I think, yeah, in but but in in both cases, it's the same quote from the Sour Lemon score, oh. and it's where Walker doesn't talk. Oh, so I was wondering if that was sort of emblematic for you of this. Well, I mean, he's I mean, he's the wit about him is that he he doesn't talk. He's like the most close mouthed character in the world, and he also says little. Even the last end of a novel, he says little. So you know, that, that was all really. We'll open to questions. Please wait till the microphone comes to you. There's a line uh, that uh, when I was doing the book on merch, I, I, I told um, Westlake, and he had a great line about editors. <laughs> and he said, film editing, hang on, I can see. this earlier on, did you? Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't quote. Oh. I refer to it because that's yeah. the epigraph to. So the I was book. saying I was doing this book on uh, Walter Murch, and he said, "Film editing is a wonderful arcane art, like mosaics. I love to watch it being done, but they, of course, hate to be watched. Even the editors sound like Parker, you know, for him." <laughs> that's a, a question. Uh, Ellen, they in. Academic criticism of uh, crime fiction, there's this distinction between the Americans and the English, that the English uh, detectives like Father Brown, Sherlock Holmes... It's very hard to hear. Is there Parker. something wrong with the microphone, perhaps? Uh, or? Is that better? Yeah, okay. yes. In the academic writing on crime fiction, there's this distinction between the English detectives like Father Brown, Sherlock Holmes, who solve puzzles and the American writers who grapple with mysteries. Um, and it seemed to me a lot of this film was very much that way. He's trying to locate a, a person in the corporation. He's trying to find an answer, and there is ultimately no answer. There's no thread you can pull in at all. And that seemed um, suggestive of the wider style of the writer. Is, is that correct? So you're saying this is more English than American in, in that no, you know, it's, it's very American. The whole idea yeah. that, that the culture is, is the mystery and the puzzle. There's no, there's no answer to it. There's no one person right. you can find to ascribe guilt to or get paid by. Or the corporation is this roving corruption. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, I, w I would say that's true. I mean, it's probably more European too. That whole kind of non-ending element. Any other questions? Here. May I ask you a question about the English patient? Is that okay? I guess so. Okay. Because this has always bothered me and something that I'd wanted to ask you. <laughs> the problem um, with the book. Yeah, I know. No, no. Well, so <laughs> I felt in the book the most important, the eureka moment was when Kip realizes Hiroshima, they would only have done this to non whites. That changes his life. And he, he leaves, he goes back to India. Right. But it doesn't happen in the movie. No. And I felt that that was leaving out one of the most important parts of the entire book. How did you feel about that? Did that bother you? Uh, I, I think it bothered me, and I think it bothered Anthony Minghella as well, because he had written that scene that you're speaking about where he reacts to the news of Hiroshima. And they just didn't know how to f fix it. What happened was, in the, they did the assembly of the film, which was already long, um, and 
they had that scene where Kip hears the news on the radio, shortwave radio, and responds very angrily, obviously. And everyone who was watching the film said, where did this come from? You know, and, and I think what happens with, with film is a film, if you're in, you know, in Egypt or wherever the film takes place for two hours, in the last 10 minutes you bring in Hiroshima and that, it's, it's like a stranger has walked in and ended the movie or book. Where, and whereas a novel can deal with that kind of thing. So there was a huge discussion and, you know, worrying about this and they had to kind of somehow remove that sequence and give Kip another reason to leave. So he leaves for the, because of the death of his friend. Um, you know, it worried me. And, you know, I think there were a lot of responses when the book came out to that. And also people who were very angry at that sentence being there. And it would never have dropped it on a white nation. But in fact, uh, our Canadian prime minister of the time actually said, thank God they didn't drop it on a white nation. Uh, Mackenzie, Mackenzie King said that. I didn't realize that. Yeah. He said it in his letters, which I found much later on. So it was a guess. Thank you. And that, I, yeah. I felt that that was the most important part of the book. Yeah. Although I love the book and the movie. It's two very different okay. things. Thank you. Thanks. Questions back there? This isn't a question. It's just an observation. Where are you? I'm up over here. <laughs> There? Yeah. Hi. It's just an observation. Yep. He couldn't possibly have taken the money because he never would have been able to swim carrying a suitcase. <laughs> and if he put it in his pockets, 93 grand would be too heavy. Yeah. 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 Thank you for <laughs> thank you for solving that problem. <laughs> Maybe this time, maybe this time he didn't have to swim. I mean, maybe there. How did he get he was, there? He was there, there? There might be a yeah. boat <laughs> with Fairfax or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, if this isn't one of your favorite films, can you tell us oh, what God. some of your favorite films are? Um, I, I probably couldn't. You know, I, I'm losing my memory very slowly or very fast. I'm not quite sure which. Um, <laughs> At the back of at the back of the, the conversations book that I did about Walter Murch, they asked for a biography, and I just listed ten films there. So, and I'll I'll have to look there, or I'll have to find that. You know, I can't remember right. I can't remember a single one apart from Point Blank, obviously. You know. Any other questions? Any other trick questions? Then? Yes, one here. Oh, there's one up there. Uh, why do you think they changed the name from Parker to Walker? I just thought of that recently because, you know, I, I was told um, that if you kind of write a book where the character is called Walker or James Smith in a novel and someone buys the movie rights to it. They own the movie rights to that character. Uh, this happened to um, a, a couple of writers I've heard who sold movie rights to one of their books and then, and then they continue to write more books in that, in a, in a series. You know, they were, those were owned by that film company. I don't know if it's still true, but that was a strange kind of ownership of the character. Now, I don't know. I just thought of this actually a few days ago, but why, why Walker and why Parker? Walker does sound good. He's all. Yeah, but, but, it's, but there have been a number of other Parker movies. In fact, there's even the most recent one I think was called Parker. Yeah, yeah. So there have been film versions of Parker Yes, that's okay. But I mean, me, meanwhile, our uh, 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 author is dead. And they've just had, oh, to so buy, you think they can, they had to buy the movie rights okay. or something like that. Could be. Yeah. There's a question over here. Um, Eleanor mentioned before that uh, that your some of your writing was very cinematic. Mm. And I'm wondering about the ways in which, as a film fan, you think that actually the evolution of cinema and editing has influenced the way you write. OK. I'm, I'm very, I mean, people have said that you know, I'm my writing is filmic and I actually I don't find it so because I think I'm much more interested in thinking thinking my way through a novel 
but I mean, I'm suddenly aware of weather, light, sound, all those things, which are things that we use in, in film. I don't think, apart from talking obsessively about the damn book, you know, The Hunter, uh, I don't think I am that in, in influenced by it, but I'm... Well, you've, I'm talk, you've talked about editing, the similarities yes. in edit, the editing process. Editing, I, I, I think uh, uh, film editing is a very, very precise, almost microscopic art form. Uh, and, and taken very, very serious, seriously as it has to be compared to editing in books. I'm not saying that books are not edited seriously. They obviously they are. And I've worked with very, very good editors. But I think in, in general, you know, people hand in manuscripts after the first or second draft and you think, wait a minute, they need to be edited much, much more, you know. And, and in film, the editing is so precise. You've got 24 frames a second. If you cut the seventh frame as opposed to the 18th frame, which is like a fraction of a second, it makes a difference. So, uh, and so the pacing, all, the, all that stuff that happens in, in film editing is wonderfully intricate, you know, and um, just in the sound that in the back, and we talked about sound when we came here to talk about the English patient. So it's a very, very precise kind of art form uh, and obsessively so, you know. So I think editing, because I, I edited a couple of documentary films earlier on in my career, and they, you know, I just love the craft of editing because you could you could change everything as as they did with this film. I think you know you can add the sound of rain, you can add different kind of weather systems, you can add music, etc., and everything can change within that. Or it be, be it could be an abrupt scene as opposed to a drawn out one. Could you please comment on <clears throat> the noise in the movie? Uh, there were a number of times when the it was louder than it really needed to be. It was overwhelming. At least I found it so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's funny when I when I wrote this little thing that Anil writes uh, talks to her friend Leaf about. They say it's a terrific film and there's very little music. But in fact, there is music in the film, but you're not conscious of it as as much. You know, it's not aria type music where the emotion is. The emotion is underplayed because all that's happening is Lee Marvin is looking at someone and not saying a word, you know. So you can't have that kind of music. Either. But there are the violence scenes certainly are like that. Yeah. They also, I think, I think I understood what Anna and Leaf were saying because they're also surprising cuts to silence, mm -hmm. where there has been music or there has been a lot of noise, and then there'll be a cut. Yeah. There, yeah. To, to, to almost silence. Yeah, and that's that's again. John Borman's filmmaking, I think, and, and, and much more European filmmaking. Yeah. There was a question over here. That'll be the last question. Sorry. Um, I didn't realize that when you sell your book and the rights to it, that when a director takes it, they can they have liber uh, liberty to change stuff. Isn't there anything as an author that you have power to say, look, I have a book. It's great, and I want to decide who I want to direct this book. That would be ideal, yeah. I, I think uh, <laughs> it's very difficult, you know. To I think the minute you give your book away, someone can turn it into a musical, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, that, that's a big problem, I think, for writers and and, and with the film. You know, you can be very lucky, as I was, or unlucky. You know. Um, Scott Spencer had a book called Endless Love, which was a fantastic book and a terrible movie. And what he could say was, I got a great song out of it. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, so that can happen. I don't know how, how you do uh, solve that problem. You know, you have to trust the person or have, you can have uh, veto rights on the script or something like that. I mean, I know some writers just say, you know, take the money and run, and mm -hmm. will then say, my book is still there. You know, when the, when someone comes over them and says, did you see what they did to your book? He says, well, my my book is still there. Yeah. It's, yeah. But I can imagine it yeah. being frustrating. Any more questions? Well, we'll take one more. I know we, that was said that was the last one, but let's if there is one more. Yes, back there. Is there a microphone? Oh, we have to send the microphone out. Thank you.
Hi. Um, two of the things that I found really interesting in the film mm. was were the use of color mm -hmm. and the frequency with which there were a lot of straight lines or geometric shapes. And I'm wondering if you can comment on either of those. Well, I mean that that's I think very uh, that is evident in, in the film, and it's 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 a it's a it's that kind of world that Walker is flung into. I think in in the film, it, it is ge very geometrical. I think it's, it's said. Um, the color is, I guess, San Francisco. I mean, I, I don't know. Well, uh, Borman said that um, this was his first film in color, and each yeah. scene is a different color. Huh. And I don't know if you noticed, but there was the scene in the in the the first scene in the office with the uh, the, the the organization, and every all the men, it's all men in suits, and they're all wearing suits, uh, green suits, different shades of green suits, and mm. and he said that he felt he could control it better because he was not. All his work in, in TV was all in black and white. His earlier film, but the Dave Clark Fly, was black and white. This was his first. He thought he could control it better if he could do each scene would be in a different color. He said the studio went crazy and said, you know, you, we can't release this. But you kind of don't notice it, and the light the light picks up different tones. And then it, the, the, it went from cold to warm. That by the end, and I don't know if you remember, like Angie Dickinson's, you know, orange dress, and then her red mm -hmm. dress, and then and even even Parker is wearing, uh, you know. Sort of, warmer colored suits and, and brighter ties. And so just that he wanted to go from, mm -hmm. from cool to warm. So it was very deliberate. He also painted everything. There's a lot of things that were painted. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned in your opening remarks that there's uh, the use of the, <coughs> the, tel yeah. the telescope. Yeah. They painted it yellow because I think Angie Dickinson was wearing yellow <laughs> dress at that time and maybe he had a yellow tie or something. I mean, it, he said he often paints things yeah. to control the environment. And you know, later on, when someone like Coppola was making a film, you know, he would cast, uh, uh, which was the one with um, um, Gene Hackman as the the conversation. The conversation. He had characters wear the same clothes all the way through the film, same clothes, the most boring, uninteresting clothes, so that you could uh, cut it from scene eight to scene one and back to scene eight, and there'd be no problem, you know. Uh, and actually, and and. Um, Coppola left the film two thirds of the way through, leaving two thirds of a film that Merch had to cut together. And luckily, that's, 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 that's what saved him. You know, he, could re he could rewrite the, the script, the action, because of everyone was wearing the same clothes all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And Michael will be signing books outside.